This is part six of the Ontario Apple IPM workshop series, Indirect Insect Pests. My name is Christy Greg McGuffin. I'm a horticulture integrated pest management specialist with Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And throughout this workshop series, we'll be looking at a number of insect and diseases common in Ontario apple orchards, including their biology, identification, how to monitor for them, and general management practices. So before we get into a discussion on the particular insect pests, I wanted to just touch base on what is meant by a direct versus an indirect pest. And now this really depends on what part of the plant is attacked. In apples in particular, a direct insect pest feed, feeds specifically on the fruit, whereas an indirect pest is an insect that attacks the leaves, the trunk, or any other part of the tree. Now, major pests have the potential to cause some major economic loss. And in most cases, direct pests are also considered major pests. And while indirect pests may limit fruit yield, they're often considered minor pests. That does not mean that indirect pests cannot cause significant economic loss in an orchard. The following presentation is going to look at the indirect insect pests that are present in Ontario apple orchards. And this includes spotted tentiform leaf miner, mites, dogwood borer, aphids, leaf hopper, scale, and leaf curling midge. And activity of these pests vary depending on the species. Activity can begin anywhere from bud break right up until harvest. The first pest we're going to look at is spotted tentiform leaf miner. Now this is a pest that is controlled quite well in our existing insect management programs across the province. However, it's entirely possible that there could be an increase in damage caused by this pest uh, with the loss of some control products on the market. There are a few uh, life stages that you will see in the orchard. Um, the larval stage is actually divided into two stages. The sap feeder stage, which has a flat head capsule and is quite wedge-shaped uh, larval body, whereas the older instars uh, are known as tissue feeders, and they have oval head capsules and are quite long and thin. You may see the adult, uh, as you walk through the orchard, uh, fly away from, from rest on the leaf. And this is a, a gold, white, and black banded moth. So there are three generations per year of tentiform leaf miner. The first generation adults emerge late April to May. Second generation adults are typically mid to late June, while the third generation adults are usually August into September. And usually with tentiform leaf miner, healthy trees can tolerate considerable injury. And so thresholds are rather high uh, or non-existent in that later stage when the foliage gets quite dense. However, with high populations, it is entirely possible that there can be premature fruit drop that occurs, in particular in cultivars like Macintosh. So as I mentioned, those two different stages uh, of larval development, the, the sap feeder stage causes damage on the underside of the leaf only, and it actually tunnels into the first layer of that tissue. And so damage can't be seen from the upper side of the leaf. It needs to be flipped over to look at the underside. The tissue feeder stage, though, starts to feed on that epidermal layer so that that window pane feeding that you can see on the picture on the right uh, can be viewed from the top part of the leaf. So there are pheromone traps that are available, uh, but they're not widely used in the province, typically just observing um, the fruit spurs and leaves from trees during regular monitoring checks is enough to keep an eye out for this population. Now it's important to distinguish between those two stages of, of larval development, because once the tissue feeding mines predominate in an orchard, then insecticides can't be used to control this stage. So the table that you see here uh, on this slide uh, gives a breakdown of the thresholds that do exist uh, if control is needed for this pest. Um, and as you can see that by that third generation, control measures are generally not recommended just because uh, the, the trees can really withstand higher populations uh, with that dense canopy. 
So good orchard sanitation can really help reduce those overwintering populations and that can be mulching the leaves or applying leaf urea similar to what you would do for scab control. There are beneficial insects that do have efficacy against these pests and so it's important then when, when selecting an insecticide program, considering the impact that these insecticides have on the beneficials uh, and what sort of control programs you're receiving from, from these populations in the orchard. With mites, there are two major mite pests that are found in apples in Ontario, and that's European red mite and two-spotted spider mite. Now, some orchards do deal with apple rust mite, but that's not going to be discussed in this presentation. Mites in general favor hot, dry conditions, so really see populations uh, spike during those warm, uh, warm conditions in the middle of the summer. Development tends to occur faster with these populations during that time, so you can really see things move quickly uh, when you reach those hot summer, summer days. So mites feed on the sap of the leaves and so this results in leaf stippling are also known as bronzing. You can see uh, in the, the picture on the right, these top two leaves have that distinct uh, bronzing occurring from mite feeding damage as compared to the nice uh, green tissue that's found on the, the leaves below. Um, so with this damage, it does reduce the photosynthet photosynthetic capabilities of the leaves. So you can see under, under high mite pressure, you can see reduction in shoot growth um, impacts to, to fruit development, including fruit set as well as fruit, fruit color. Um, and high mite populations can also reduce the winter hardiness of the tree as well. European red mite is most prevalent of the two mite species, and the name fits it well. The nymphs and adults are both a distinct red color that can be quite easy to see under the use of a hand lens. The eggs can be laid on the bark of the tree, as you can see here. Um, as this obvious red color when they are viable. Uh, and activity begins in the spring. Uh, uh, activity of the adults and nymphs can continue all the way up until harvest. So they overwinter as these eggs um, on the bark close to the main trunk of the tree. An egg hatch typically begins about tight cluster. Then throughout the season, there can be multiple generations that happen. And with mites, they are overlapping generations. And so this means that you can have eggs, nymphs, and adults all at the same time. When the season comes to an end, then the female begins laying the eggs ready for overwintering. And these are usually on the branches or, or on the trunk of the tree, uh, but they can also lay them on the calyx end of the fruit. So you may see uh, this egg development um, at the end of the season as well. Two spotted spider mites, uh, the eggs are clear to cream color, uh, Well, the nymphs and adults are a straw color with two very distinct dark spots on their back. And true to their name, uh, they produce a dense webbing along the leaves, very similar to spider silk. Now two spotted spider mite overwinters uh, under bark or typically on the orchard floor. And so the populations actually uh, build up on the weeds on the orchard floor before coming up into the tree. So usually populations aren't starting to, aren't started to, uh, to be observed until mid to late summer. And after this point, then there are multiple generations again of overlapping generations where you can have uh, eggs, nymphs and adults at the same time. And these populations can be, be dispersed really easily throughout the orchard. Um, through, through wind currents. So monitoring for mites in that early stage uh, from tight cluster to petal fall and looking at fruit spurs for signs of that overwintering, of those overwintering eggs as well as that early hatch activity. Following petal fall, then it's looking at the leaves, presence of leaves. So collecting, ideally collecting two leaves from 25 trees throughout the orchard uh, and looking at this under hand lens or microscope to see the presence of mite activity. So Red Delicious Empire and Gala tend to support largest populations, but there aren't any trees that are known to be uh, resistant to mites. It's also really important when you are doing these mite counts to also record the beneficials because this can help to delay or prevent the need for a miticide application. 
So this is just a closer look at the leaf and under high pressure situations, you can see it with the, with the naked eye. Uh, and it's entirely possible with those higher populations for mites to feed on both the underside as well as the top part of the leaf. This chart is just giving a breakdown of the, the thresholds that are in place for mite might control. Um, and as you can see that the thresholds actually uh, get larger as the season progresses. And this is just because the tree is able to uh, handle larger populations of this pest just because of a denser canopy. So cover crop and weed management is very important, especially in terms of managing two-spotted spider mites. Uh, in the very dry seasons when the ground cover starts to dry up, it's not uncommon for two-spotted spider mite to move up early into the tree. With mites though, beneficial insects are so important in terms of managing these populations. There are numerous predators that are, are present in the orchard, including predatory mites, thrips, aureus, lacewing, ladybug, lady beetle, mullen bug. And so all of these can really help keep those populations at bay, which is why it's important to only use a miticide if absolutely necessary. And when selecting an insecticide program to really consider the impacts on these beneficial insects as any sort of product that can have uh, negative impacts can cause some fairly significant mite flare ups in later season. The use of uh, oil, both as a delayed dormant and summer oil, can be a really nice option for mite control um, as it does provide a softer option for those beneficial insects. So dogwood borer is the uh, more common insect pest uh, that targets the, the trunk or the base of the tree. Uh, and so what happens is the larva shown here at the bottom left actually burrows into the trunk of the tree and feeds on the tissue within the tree. The adult then emerges, shown here on the bottom right. So dogwood borer is a clear wing moth. It's a black body with very distinct yellow bands and legs. And this damage can occur typically at the base of the tree. The, the larva tends to um, favor weakened spots on the tree, whether that's from an existing wound or canker, um, but very often uh, it enters through burr knots around the graft union of the tree. And you can really see presence of, notice presence of this pest um, by observing frass, or insect excrement that's extruding from the, the tunnels, as well as seeing uh, signs of pupil cases, as you can see extending here uh, from this burr knot. And that's when the adults emerge, uh, then the leftover pupil case uh, remains in the tree. So cutting away that, that bark, you can really start to see discoloration of the cambium that occurs because of that larval feeding within the tree. And with those populations, if they do get extensive enough, then you can start to really see a reduction in yield uh, leading to eventual tree death as well. It also, with, this, uh, with these dogwood borers, it also makes the tree more susceptible to secondary infection. So it's entirely possible for opportunistic pathogens to enter into those tunnels, things like black rot, uh, and can increase the, the rate on that tree collapse. Dogwood borer overwinters as larva within those galleries in the trunk, uh, and the adults begin to emerge in June. And this is one generation, but flight can occur all the way through until September. Peak flight's typically about mid-July, but, uh, but it can be quite extended in terms of its emergence. So it's not necessarily something that's monitored and controlled in every orchard. Those orchards that do have a history of dogwood borer uh, can monitor using pheromone traps. And these uh, need to be installed early to mid-June in order to, uh, to get that adult flight activity. Otherwise, just visually examining the tree for signs of tunnels, for presence of pupil cases, or, or any sort of frass that may be around the area. So because they, this borer does tend towards uh, trees that produce uh, a number of burr knots, um, then selecting rootstocks that have a lower tendency for burr knot formation is ideal. Um, susceptible rootstocks can include M9 and M26. 
Also considering about the use of guards that are put around the base of the tree, uh, wire mesh guard tends to have uh, less borer damage than those, uh, than those that use solid guards. A lot of times this is because uh, quite a bit of leaf litter can build up within those solid mesh guards or solid guards uh, and create quite a, an ideal habitat for borers. Another option too um, is to use latex paint on the lower trunk of the tree. Now this would need to be reapplied on a regular basis though in order to, to really uh, have efficacy against borer. There is mating disruption that's commercially available for dogwood borer and it is very effective for this pest. Ideal, it's ideal to use it uh, with a pest like this because of that extended emergence uh, can make chemical control really difficult. There would be a requirement for multiple applications of chemical, uh, whereas with mating disruption within a few years, you can have really effective management and reduction of those populations. Moving on to aphids, there are a number that we see in Ontario apple orchards, but in general, aphids tend to feed in colonies. So it's very uncommon to see one or two aphids on their own. They tend to be in quite large groups in an area. And with all aphids, they have two cornicles that extend off their back end, also known as, as tailpipes or exhaust pipes. Aphids really favor cool, wet springs. Uh, they, they tend to feed on very succulent, uh, lush tissue. And so in those wet springs, when we get a lot of canopy growth, uh, it's not uncommon to see populations really start to, uh, to get quite high. Uh, and there's a number of generations per year that can be produced with aphids, depending on temperature. So as I mentioned, there's a number that we do see in Ontario apple orchards, in particular, rosy apple aphid, green apple aphid, and woolly apple aphid. And I'll go into a little bit more detail with each of these. So green apple aphid uh, gets its name. It's a green aphid, uh, has uh, black tailpipes, as you can see in the top left picture, um, as well as black legs. Now, early season, typically these are wingless, uh, but as the colonies begin to, uh, to really expand, um, then winged species or wing individuals can be produced, uh, and these help distribute the colonies throughout the orchard. So with feeding, uh, you can see leaf curling that occurs with green apple aphid, dam or with green apple aphid feeding. Um, with feeding, they also secrete a very sticky substance called honeydew, and it's not uncommon for sooty mold to develop on top of that. And with the presence of sooty mold, then it can leave the apples unmarketable. So green apple aphid is typically active late May all the way through summer. Um, looking at terminals from, from approximately 10 trees can, can help with identifying uh, population pressure. The threshold is actually quite high for green apple aphid. The trees can really withstand high populations of this pest, um, and, but, uh, but also keeping in mind the presence of beneficials uh, to help really keep some of these populations um, at bay. Rosy apple aphid, on the other hand, does cause uh, some fairly significant economic damage. So the thresholds for rosy apple aphid are much lo lower than green. With rosy apple aphid, it's a pale pink color. Um, and similar to green apple aphid, both uh, wingless and winged uh, individuals can be produced in the colony. So the type of damage that, uh, that can occur from rosy apple aphid feeding is this uh, malformed or pygmy fruit. And this is because of a toxin within the saliva of rosy apple aphid as it feeds uh, and then it can, then it can change this, uh, the growth, the natural growth of the fruit. Um, it can also cause the, cur the leaves to curl and become quite tight. Um, and this can really reduce the vigor of those terminals. There are some susceptible cultivars, uh, including Cortland, Ida Red, and Golden Delicious. So as I mentioned, rosy apple aphid does have this toxin in the saliva, and not only does it cause the pygmy fruit, but it can also serve as a stop drop where it prevents the, the release of the fruit at harvest time. And it can also have an impact on the growth of both roots and woody tissue of the tree.
So damage to the leaf can look quite similar to some other pests that are present in the orchard. So this picture is comparing rosy apple aphid leaf damage to, to that of leaf curling midge. And as you can see, both can turn the leaf a nice, uh, a nice bright pink hue uh, and cause leaf curling. With rosy apple aphid, this curling typically happens downwards um, with, the, with the aphids feeding on the underside of the leaf. Leaf curling midge, on the other hand, the, this is a gall that's formed, so the curls are very tight. Um, they also curl upwards and into that inner vein. So rosy apple aphid can be active quite early in the season, beginning around tight cluster, and continues until about midsummer, where it starts to move on to its summer hosts. Uh, most of its activity is largely asso associated around fruit clusters, in particular areas uh, where they're rather sheltered um, and slow drying. So looking in that inner and upper canopy is really ideal. And so trying to, to check about five clusters from 20 trees during a regular scouting program. Um, and note that, the, that there is, as I mentioned, there is a lower threshold uh, for this pest compared to green apple aphid. So if more than 5% of the clusters that were observed um, are infested with rosy apple aphid and there are very few predators that have been identified, then a control measure would be warranted. So the last aphid is woolly apple aphid. Uh, this is a little bit different from the other two. Uh, it tends to not be so much on the foliage, but, uh, but really found on those developing shoots. Uh, really common around areas of pruning cuts or right in the crotches of new shoots. Um, and it can be very distinct in terms of its appearance. So the aphids actually produce um, a very cottony or woolly uh, covering, protective covering. And so it can look like balls of cotton balls uh, throughout the trees. The damage though, they, are, they can form galls um, in the feeding areas on those, uh, those young succul succulent branches. Um, and this can happen both on the new growth, the new, new trig growth, and so impacts uh, tree vigor. It can also, colonies can also exist on the roots, causing galls on the roots as well. So you can have this reduction in vigor either through that shoot growth uh, or through the overall tree health. And with this damage, it can also make the tree much more susceptible to, to winter injury. Similar to the other aphids, uh, woolly apple aphid also secretes honeydew, uh, and so you can get the formation of sooty molds developing uh, where insect feeding has been occurring. So woolly apple aphid actually starts early season with their activity. It can start around tight cluster to pink timing with the crawlers moving around through the tree to establish new feeding areas. Um, however, you typically don't start to really see the populations with those white cottony masses until later into the summer uh, and, and can be quite a nuisance during harvest time. But overall, you're looking for that cottony waxy coverings, particularly around pruning cuts, um, around young shoots, and especially with water sprouts later season. So I've mentioned a number of times the importance of beneficials, both for mites as well as for aphids. And this is just an example of some of the numerous beneficial insects that are present in the orchard and can do a really effective job managing these populations. So it's really important in terms of selecting, uh, if, uh, if an insecticide program is, is used, of selecting those products that have the lowest impact on these beneficial insects. So overall, in terms of aphid management, as I mentioned before, that aphids tend towards lush canopy growth. So trying to prevent that or reduce that growth as much as possible by limiting nitrogen levels, uh, considering the use of apogee at petal fall timing. Um, as well as, as pruning as much as you can in terms of reducing that growth, but uh, being aware with those pruning cuts that they do tend to be attract and attracted to, uh, attractive to woolly apple aphid. You could consider with those large pruning cuts of even painting the areas, uh, again, to help to reduce that, uh, that attractiveness for woolly apple. 
There are some resistant rootstocks to woolly apple aphid that are available on the market. Um, however, this isn't transferred um, to the scion. So these resistant rootstocks work against the, the root populations um, of woolly apple aphid. Any aerial populations that are up in the foliage are not going to be controlled with resistant rootstocks. So in terms of chemical controls, um, the use of a delayed dormant oil applied uh, for mites may have some efficacy on overwintering aphid eggs, but otherwise uh, really selecting uh, chemical controls that have the lowest impact on those beneficial organisms to, uh, to really help uh, maintain that control for aphid pests. With leafhoppers, there are two main species in Ontario apple orchards, the white apple leafhopper and potato leafhopper. White apple leafhopper, as you can see, both the nymph and adults are quite a, a white to cream colored in appearance. Um, the nymph, depending on feeding, may turn a slight green color um, as, it, uh, as it consumes the leaf, uh, the leaf sap. So as it feeds, it causes this leaf stippling appearance can also cause this uh, droppings to appear on fr the, the developing fruit. Now, all of this can be washed off, um, but it can, be, uh, can leave the fruit unmarketable if populations are very high. So white apple leafhopper uh, typically uh, starts to emerge late May and early June, and then we'll have another flush again close to harvest time. So looking during monitoring program, looking on the underside of leaves, this is where you're going to find leaf hoppers present, checking at least five leaves from 20 trees or 10 leaves from 10 trees. Um, and from this, the threshold is usually about two to five nymphs per leaf in a 100 leaf sample then warrants having some sort of management program. Be prepared that they, the adults, both adults and nymphs, do move relatively quickly. So as you're checking these leaves, they can move um, relatively fast. So trying to keep at arm's length so you're not brushing against those leaves as much as possible uh, when you're doing your, your monitoring checks. Potato leafhopper is more of a lime green appearance uh, compared to the white apple leafhopper. Uh, uh, with white eyes um, on the sides of his head. So it makes it a little bit different from, uh, from mullen bug, which is that lime green appearance with red eyes. And to differ differentiate white apple leafhopper from potato leafhopper, it's often by the way that they walk when they're disturbed. So as you can see from this video, White apple leafhopper moves forward and back as opposed to potato leafhopper, which in this video you can see moves sideways almost like a crab-like walk. So potato leafhopper ha actually has uh, toxins within its saliva that can cause pretty significant economic damage. Um, and this is known as hopper burn. So it basically limits the nutrient flow uh, at the feeding site. And so the leaves can get this quite uh, yellowing to, to brown discoloration along the leaf margins and they can curl underneath. And this is impacting the, the new terminal growth, which can really impede um, the, the vigor of that shoot. So this curling can look very similar to rosy apple aphid. However, with potato leafhopper, this is on the leaf terminals. The newest growth is where this impact usually happens. Whereas rosy apple aphid, uh, it tends to be confined to those fruit spurs. Also with rosy, if you check under, on the underside of those leaves, oftentimes you can see that rosy colony, or if it's an old uh, colony, you can still see the casings of the, of the, the previous uh, rosy apple aphids. So potato leafhopper has a wide host range, but what's important is that it doesn't actually overwinter in Ontario. So this is usually brought in on the air currents in those early uh, thunderstorms. Uh, it's usually kind of early to mid-June. Typically, you start to see movement into the orchard after the first cut of hay happens. Uh, but it seems that it can occur earlier and earlier each season. So with potato leafhopper, checking the underside of the leaves during your regular scouts, uh, as well as looking for evidence of hopper burn with those curled leaves. So right now there's no threshold that's established for potato leaf hopper. However, it's important to keep in mind that one or two nymphs per leaf can cause very serious damage if they're left to feed for a few days.
In terms of managing leaf hoppers, um, being aware of what's around that orchard. Uh, so in particular, if there's alfalfa or, or hay fields, uh, chances are you will get a flush of, uh, of leaf hopper species coming into the orchard uh, when these are cut. Uh, typically, natural enemies don't provide effective control for leaf hoppers, uh, and chemical controls, are, the, the timing really has to be specific because it's most effective when it targets those, uh, those young nymph stages. Once you reach the adult stage, if the population is significantly adults, uh, then applying a chemical control um, will, won't be as effective because they can move so easily in and out of an orchard. Moving along to scale species, the San Jose scale is the most uh, serious of the scale pests in Ontario. So this is what I'm going to speak on during this presentation. Uh, and it's really becoming more of, more of an issue uh, in Ontario orchards. And a lot has to do with the movement away from the, the broad spectrum insecticides that were previously used uh, and, and that did have some control over this pest. So in terms of appearance, um, the, the female shown here in this, the top picture forms this, uh, this protective layer, protective shell over top of its soft orange body shown here on the, on the right side. Um, and so having this, this shell over top can really protect it, uh, both from environmental pressures as well as from protect it from sprays. So it can make management of scale really difficult to try and control once they, the, the populations get to this stage. The males, however, are winged soft body insect. Um, so they are similar in terms of size, quite small, uh, golden color, but have a very distinct band across the abdomen that can really show up on the traps when you're looking under a hand lens. So the females produce live, youngs known, live young known as crawlers. And so these crawlers emerge from underneath the, the female's uh, protective shell, uh, and they are what move throughout the tree, um, dispersing to, to, to new areas and finding new feeding sites. So you'll see these very small, almost about the, the size um, of a point of a pen, that, uh, that travel across the bark and onto the fruit. So damage from scale as those crawlers move onto the developing fruit, um, they then set in place and start feeding. Uh, and you get this distinct development that starts happening where uh, with the red halo surrounded by the insect body. Uh, and as the fruit matures uh, and expands, then with this feeding damage, it can cause deformed fruit. It also feeds on the tree itself, and so the populations can get quite extensive uh, feeding on limbs and on the trunk of the tree. And you can start to see on high pressure situations, you can start to see a red discoloration of the cambium. And this can actually, because the toxin is flowing through the tree, uh, it can actually reduce the vigor and lead to, to tree death under, under high pressure situations. So San Jose scale overwinter as immature scales on the bark of the tree. So it's also known as black caps. And the, the adults start to mature uh, and the, the males start to fly around bloom through to petal fall. So you start to see crawlers um, typically about four to six weeks after bloom. And the females can produce quite a, a number of, of live crawlers over her lifespan um, up to nine to ten per day. So populations can build really fast on a tree uh, if left unprotected. So um, there is monitoring that can be done uh, if populations are known to be present in an orchard. Um, so pheromone traps are available to, to monitor adult flight. Uh, and you can also use electrical tape, um, I, black or white depending on uh, your preference choice. And this tape is put on sticky side out on uh, infested branches. And this is used to, to trap crawlers as they move across the tape so that you can identify when crawler activity is starting. There are degree day models that are available to also determine when crawlers are active. Um, and this can be used uh, in conjunction with monitoring for adult flight. So right now there's no thresholds that are established for San Jose scale. It's really important though to identify fruit injury at harvest because that will then warrant the need for control in the following year. 
When it comes to San Jose scale, it's a difficult pest to try and manage because it is so difficult to see uh, and spread can be relatively slow across the block. However, once it's present in an orchard, it's very difficult to eradicate. So trying to have early control of this pest is really important. So pruning out those infested branches as much as possible and really inspecting any new, uh, new plant material that's coming into the orchard for signs of scale can help with that early prevention. Biological controls are also really effective with the number of natural enemies that are around that can target, especially those soft body crawler stage. So really trying to select insecticide programs that are soft on those beneficials, similar to what you would be doing for mite and aphid control as well. With scale, the first line of defense and one of the most effective uh, means of control is the use of a dormant oil to target those overwintering immature scales. Because at this point, they haven't formed that protective uh, thick wax coating over top of their bodies. And so the oil at that point is able to penetrate much easier and leading to suffocation of the populations. So you can really get a significant reduction in the overall orchard population by using dormant oil. And the last pest that I would like to focus on in this presentation is the apple leaf curling midge. And this is becoming uh, more and more of an issue uh, in orchards across province. It was originally considered to be more of an issue, more of a concern uh, in nursery and young trees. However, it's, it is becoming um, quite a problem in well-established older orchards as well. And it can really affect that new shoot growth. So it's actually a gall forming midge. So these, uh, the curls that occur with the, uh, with the larval feeding, it's actually um, not the larva curling the leaves, but rather the feeding damage triggering a response uh, in the, the tree um, to form these tight, tight curls around the larva. So the larva goes through a number of developmental stages uh, within those curls. You can see in the picture here in those early development stages or early instars, uh, the larvae are kind of a cream, a white to a cream color, uh, but they do turn to quite a vibrant orange um, in, that later, in their later developmental stages, uh, just before they're about to pupate. So the female actually lays her eggs within the newest growth. So it's the leaves that haven't unfurled yet uh, in those new terminals. And so as those leaves are starting to emerge, uh, then the larvae start to feed immediately. So the leaves kind of come out with those galls already being initiated. So the, the adult itself is a small midge fly. Um, it has beaded antenna. Um, and long legs. Now on a monitoring trap, uh, what you typically see with leaf curling midge is the presence uh, of the red hemolymph on the, on the trap itself. So in this video, you can see here, uh, the, the female is laying her egg, again, within the newest of leaves within that, that terminal. And so they're down protected into those creases and it can really uh, limit the efficacy of chemical controls to try and target where these, the activity is occurring. So once you know what you're looking for, the eggs can be quite relatively easy to see with the naked eye, um, but it's always helpful using a hand lens or microscope. And so as you can see there, the, the um, more formed leaves have been pulled off and you're looking at the newest unfurled leaves uh, in a terminal and you can see those orange bullet shaped eggs that have been laid in all of those creases. So a light orange with a dark orange circle is kind of characteristic of the leaf curling midge eggs and they're often laid in clusters. So as those larval feed, as I mentioned, it, it triggers that gall forming action of the leaf. Uh, the leaf turns quite a vibrant color um, from a pink to a purple. Um, and as those curls age, then they can become quite brittle. But it's the larvae themselves that, um, that continue to develop inside those, those curled leaves. Um, and this is going to reduce any sort of photosynthesis for that new terminal and can really impede the growth of the, of the shoots. So this video is just showing those the active larva inside. You can see as you uncurl the leaf, 
that those, uh, those larvae continue to feed inside, starting to turn orange, so they're getting ready to pupate, uh, where they'll drop to the soil and pupate uh, to emerge as adults for the next generation. So there are some, uh, some similar pest uh, damage that can occur in the orchard that you can mistake. Leaf curling image damage for, uh, for instance, uh, with leaf, leaf roller damage. Now with leaf curling midge, again, those, those galls are very tight and brittle. Um, so you can, it, it can be rather difficult to unfold, whereas leaf roller tends to have quite loose rolls. Uh, there's also typically the presence of webbing and frass uh, with any sort of leaf roller damage. So leaf curling midge overwinter as larva in the leaf litter and the adults start to emerge early season. Uh, and this can, can occur as early as um, half inch green to tight cluster. Uh, and that flight occurs throughout petal fall. Um, and there's multiple generations then that continue all the way into to harvest and late fall. Now rainfall really affects development and emergence of this pest and so if you if there are those dry summers um, then it is possible that development can be delayed. So pheromone traps are available for monitoring leaf curling midge um, as well a degree day model uh, is under development currently however just noting leaf curling and discoloration during regular terminal checks can also help in terms of, uh, of understanding activity um, and you can also if possible also looking for um, egg laying um, can can give an idea of when curling will be expected. So there are several beneficial insects that are really excellent at controlling apple leaf curling midge populations, including mullein bug and aureus or minute pirate bug. Uh, these can be very effective in getting inside those curls and eating the soft bodied insects. So really trying to select uh, insecticides, um, an insecticide program that is soft on these beneficials is really important. It's also really difficult uh, with an insecticide program specifically for leaf curling midge because they are curled inside the leaf and protected inside the leaf. So trying to select products that do have efficacy against these can be really difficult, which is why it's important to try and support those beneficial populations. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. If you're looking for more information, I do encourage you to check out the Apple module on the Ontario Crop IPM website. That information can also be found in our publication 310, Integrated Pest Management for Apples. And with that, I thank you for joining me. My contact information is on this slide if you would like to reach out with any comments or questions. I also encourage you to subscribe to our fruit blog at onfruit.ca to receive timely information about fruit production in Ontario.